Here we go into our second part, the hierarchy and the papacy. So our two essential questions here is what is the hierarchical structure of the church and what is the papacy? Okay. Uh, point number one, right, that Christ endowed the church, gave the church that hierarchical structure, something we've talked about before. In which those in authority, who are those in authority? The Pope, the bishops, priests, deacons, and communion with him. They serve, how? By teaching, ruling, and sanctifying. So we're going to talk about those three points, really. Teaching, ruling, sanctifying. Of course, we start by saying that Christ is the cornerstone, right? He is Christ. He is the one. He's the one that establishes it, sets it. That's what we got all last chapter. We talked about it a lot, right? Christ himself is forever that chief cornerstone. He is forever the true shepherd of souls, right? He always remains the head of the church. Yet, right, it is in Scripture, and we see in the early church, through the tradition of the church, and how the apostles really start living it out right after Christ leaves, is that even though Christ is the head of the church, he is the cornerstone, the foundation stone, he is the shepherd of souls, he did establish Peter and the apostles and the successors of Peter to shepherd the church, right? With Peter being that chief shepherd, right? Remember, keep in mind, Christ guaranteed Peter when he said all this. He said, the gates of the other world will not prevail against you. He said, I will give you all the Holy Spirit, right? I put in the y'all, Texas, right? Christ guaranteed that St. Peter and his successors would then be free from error, right? The church would be protected. The Holy Spirit would guide it. There is no error in the divine one, right? Um, and, and so we see that, free from error. And that idea and that understanding of Peter being able to lead people to Christ and teach people Christ and not falsities about Christ, right? that Christ promised is giving him his authority. The church understands that as uh, a thing that it entitles and calls infallibility, right? Infallibility, that guarantee that Christ makes, saying, Peter, you will be free from error in your teachings on faith and morals, in your role as the handing on, hander on of my authority, right? Um, that's what that's all about. A lot of times infallibility is thought, well, the church just says this guy can't do anything wrong, or this guy can't make an error, da 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 da, da. And it's all about Peter and all about the church and this idea of saying, oh, the church is sinner, the church is corrupt, the church is this, this, it's limited, it's human. Right? How can I say something's free from error? It seems like hocus pocus or magic or, or foolishness. Right? But the definition, the idea of infallibility, is not really a statement about the greatness of Peter or the greatness of the church. This statement's really talking about the greatness of the promise of Christ, right? That Christ promised that the church would be free from error and that Peter would be able to lead the flock of Christ. He would have the authority of Christ and be guided by the Spirit. That understanding, the promise of Christ by the Holy Spirit so that we can continue truth through this world as Christ promised, that's called infallibility. That's the best way to understand it. <laughs> now about the structure of the church. Of course, establishing a structure, organized way of the church, real visible foundation and structure is logical. Think of every kingdom. Every kingdom needs some kind of organized structure in order to endure. Any kingdom that doesn't have it is going to fall apart really quickly, right? If it doesn't have walls, if it doesn't have soldiers, if it doesn't have um, a cabinet, if it doesn't have this, this, and the other, right? It would easily fall apart. So the kingdom Christ established is supposed to last not just for a few days or a few years, but for the rest of time. Right? That being said, there should be a structure, right? And there's definitely the structure, but the structure also has great reinforcement. The mortar between the bricks is the Holy Spirit, divinity, the divine stuff, and that's not going to fall apart, right? So the hierarchical structure that Christ established, right, was when Christ chose the twelve. And that structure was passed down, and that was the passing down of the apostle authority and the apostles' understanding of what Christ had, that tradition, right? So that the church would continue the course Christ set Christ set for it. That line of bishops that stretches from the apostles, each one consecrated by the previous one, a member is called apostolic secession. Make sure we have that down. The main thing to highlight here, apostolic secession does not need to be a one-for-one -one ordination or handing on authority. You don't need, this guy's going to retire, so this guy's going to replace him. And you don't have a next guy until that guy replies, retires and you replace him. Right? There's not a need for a one-on-one -on -one thing. Uh, you even see it at the very beginning. Right? Paul comes in. He becomes an apostle to the Gentile, submits himself to the apostles. You've got Timothy, Titus, right? at the very beginning. You've got Matthias. Um, so you've got already in, in the New Testament uh, an extension from 12 to 14 and 15. Right? Um, so ordination doesn't have to be a one-to-one. -one, you have to stick with 12, right? but by need. Uh, of course, you have a minuscule seedling church 
where you've got a lead shepherd, leader of the church, is easily, is easily able to take care of them. But if that extends to the entire Roman Empire, and you only have 12 guys, right? Well, there's a lot of people that aren't going to be shepherded unless they right, continue and hand on their authority to others so that there is a shepherd over a local community. That local community, which we'll talk about later, is called the diocese, right? So you have an apostolic successor, a successor of the apostles over a local community and church to continually to guide it with the authority of the apostles. So the bishops of the church then, this giant community of the 12 and beyond their successors, with the pope as their leader, their head, is called the College of Bishops. Why is it called the College of Bishops? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. From the New Testament writings themselves, we see the bishops, but we also see uh, presbyters, the, the elders, the, the people that help out the bishop, the priests, and the deacons, right? You already see that. Um, <clears throat> so they exercise, in different degrees, Christ's own authority an authority one does not have by nature, right? You can't just say, I have the authority of Christ, I can heal people, da 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 right? I can do this, I can do that. I can give the grace to the Holy Spirit, right? Not at all the case. Christ gives the authority specifically, not to everyone, but to the apostles, right? Not even to his mother, who's closest to him, or the women, he gives it to the twelve, right? Um, so that authority originates from Christ and from Christ alone. He alone has the authority in himself to give it, right? And the apostles then receive that authority and so the apostles, the bishops, have the authority to give. Right? So all bishops, priests, and deacons get their authority and powers, again, essentially from Christ. That's the main point. Right? <clears throat> if you read about it, the church's attitude on authority, uh, this, is, this is from the textbook paragraph that starts, although there is a true equality of da 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 About authority in, in the church, it's very different than authority in the world. Authority in the world, you think of power, you think of you get to rule over people. You get people working under you. You think of all that stuff, right? But authority in the church is the more authority you have, the more you're supposed to serve, right? The more you're supposed to be uh, at the bottom, the more you're supposed to um, to help people, to help others, right? Think of Christ washing the feet of the apostles. Right? So uh, this idea, we can ask a couple questions. What's the equality, inequality of the visible church on earth? Uh, we can see there's an equality among its members. We're all called to holiness. We're all called to... Uh, uh, let go of our sinfulness and to accept God and to be in the church. We're all called to go to heaven, right? So there's equality in the authority uh, or in, in the church and the dignity of the members, right? But there's also an inequality in the church. Where do we see that? Well, Christ did set it up for a structure where some people have unique authority that others don't have, right? You've got different people in different positions and roles. It doesn't mean some people are better than other people. It means there are different roles and different tasks and different places of authority. But we all have the same calling towards holiness. So the bishop, all the way down to the little lay member who's 12 years old, are all called the same goal, holiness. 